Hi everybody, it's crazy, it's Sunday, and it's time for the UpBGE video of the week. Now before I get started, gotta give a shout out to my trust because you guys rock, to my crazy fam, I love you guys. Now we're up to episode number 137, and last week we left off with, let me see if I can get this right, quick and dirty optimization techniques. Now, we don't have any files for it, um, and if you don't have the book and this is your first time looking, you know, checking out my video, go to the links in the description, get the book, okay? And don't forget to get the files that come with it because those files do help out. Okay, so without any further ado, let's get started. All right, so quick and dirty optimization techniques. Once you've located the slowest portion of the game by looking at the profiler, here are some things you can try to speed up the game. Now, if you don't know what the profiler is, go back to last week's episode, okay, and uh, watch that video because it goes all into the profiler, okay? So, disable physics for non-essential objects. If physics is taking a large portion of the CPU time, then maybe consider disabling collision for non-essential objects. By default, all objects in the scene have collision detection turned on, so this can be slow. Changing the physics type from static to non-collision will make the physics engine work less. Setting uh, setting is found in the physics properties editor for the object okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna switch over here to here okay and i've got the sphere selected so what i'm gonna do is you what i'm talking about is this little button right here okay and then you're gonna go from static to no collision when you go to static to no collision this will not have any contact with anything else. Now, if you don't have a floor, and like right now, this is floating in space, this one will just fall right out to the sky. Okay? If you have a plane, it will drop down to the plane and stay there. Okay? Um, so that's the only collision it will have is because it's another object, and if that object has uh, collisions on it, then it will automatically act because it has no other choice. Okay? But if you put it to no collision, it will fall through an empty floor if there's nothing holding it up, okay? Wanted to let y'all know that because a lot of people think, oh, I'll just make it no collision, and they wonder why their space shooter game, everything just disappears into nothingness, just falls, okay? That's why, all right? Um, I also did a, uh, in mine, I also did that. I took all my buildings that I have in my game, and I made them all non-collision. And later on, we're going to do what we call... It, or what I'm, what I'm about to go into right now. <laughs> okay, so switch to simple collision shapes. The more complex the collision bounds, the harder the physics engine has to work. Consider using simple shapes that approximate the models by switching to a different bounding box. Setting is found in the physics properties editor. So if we go here and we go back to static, you will can, you can scroll down, okay? And then you have collision bounds. You can pick from a wide variety. Okay. Um, but you got to be careful because if you choose, like, say, for a cone, you try to do a box shape, which will be, you know, pretty good. You know, I mean, if you don't care if something, you know, hits at a certain angle, it's all about the collisions. Okay. If you've got a box collision, anything that's going to hit on any four uh, or six uh, sides is going to happen. So if you have something that's small and you hit it and it's going to automatically say, oh, you hit it. And you're like, no, I didn't. I'm like a mile off from that, you know, big, big old planet, you know. <laughs> so make sure your uh, collision boxes are worthwhile. Try to refrain from using convex hull and triangular mesh because a lot of the times they they actually have a bit bigger physical calculation because they do this what the shape of the object is if you have a character and you want it to be able to hit like the arms and stuff like that you might not want to use these two okay um you can actually use uh boxes and capsules and put them to the size of arms you know make each section to where that will happen okay uh, you don't want to try to, you know, put something like a convex hole or a triangular mesh. Uh, way back when, I was like, why not? Why not? Why not? Because they fit perfectly. I want the best collisions I can get. Um, you really don't really need it if you do, if you plan out how your game is going to work out beforehand. Okay? So, that being said, I actually used collision shapes. Um, like, say, for example, if I wanted a building, it would have a collision box like this that I built around it called the barrier. 
invisible object that is just a cube going over the building because you're not going to jump on the windows. You know, I mean, not five feet high or, you know, 20 feet high or three stories high. Okay. Now, if you were flying over and you fell, you would land on top of the building and you can walk off the edge of the building. So either which way, it all worked out. Unless you're going to plan on making it to where every edge is climbable, then you can actually put those in on your barrier. Okay, try that out. Might work. <laughs> Works for me so far. <laughs> okay, use display list. Now, this is a new one for me because I don't know how to do this one, but we're going to try to find out. When enabled... Display list caches the geometry data on the graphics card so that they do not have to be sent to the graphics card every frame. This significantly increases the performance of games that contains complex geometry. Setting, the setting is found in the render properties edit, editor. So that would be this little guy right here because the render properties. Okay, and it says it's in the render properties. There's almost no downside to this feature. Some very old graphics cards might not support it, but at the time of writing, display list works for almost all computers in use. So we're going to try to find display list. I don't remember ever seeing a display list. If you know about it, let me know because I, I don't know where you would find it. Okay, uh, nope. Use frame rate, depreciate warnings. And also, this is also something else different. Framing debug. No, I don't see anything on this, but this might be also old Blender. Um, and it might be in an older version of Blender, but it's not an UPGE because apparently they don't use it. <laughs> um, but I will look into that. And if you know anything about it, just drop it down in the comments or hop on over to my server and let me know there, okay? All right, so use power of two uh, textures. Most still do, but we're going to continue on. Older graphics cards expect, expect textures to have dimensions that are the power of twos. For example, 512 by 512 pixels or 20 by 48 pixels or 2048 by 2048 pixels and 512 by 64 pixels are good, uh, all, are all good sizes. Traditionally, non-power of two textures are automatically extended to the next highest power of two. So a 513 and by 513 pixel texture will take up as much memory as a 10, uh, 1024 by 1024 image texture when the game is running. Even though most newer graphics cards do not impose this requirement on image sizes, it's always a good idea to manually save all your images in a more compatible size trust me optimization does help use dds compressed textures if your game contains a lot of high resolution texture maps they will take up a lot of video memory file formats such as png jpeg or tga are compressed on the file level but when these images are loaded into blender they are uncompressed into a raw format so that the graphics card can quickly decode them. This makes estimating, uh, yeah, est estimating texture memory usage based on file size very difficult, since 40 megabytes worth of JPEG might take up 200 megabytes of real texture memory on the graphics card. If a game has a lot of textures, it might be worthwhile to look into texture draw surface compressed textures. Now. I know that uh, GIMP and Photoshop use that because they said it down here at the bottom, but DDS is a common name that ref uh, refers to a set of compressed image formats, specifically DXT1 through DXT5, that is designed for real-time use. In Blender, DDS textures remain compressed even after they are loaded into memory. Therefore, they take up significantly less memory than the conventional image texture. Popular image editors such as Photoshop and GIMP have plugins that support the loading and saving of DDS files. So you might want to check into that. I'm, I'm actually going to because that's kind of good because I'm really terrible at textures. And yeah, if it's going to be a JPEG or a PNG, yeah, if that does that, that's going to be a problem. Okay. All right. So 
reduce the number of dynamic lights. If rasticizer is if the rasticizer is taking up too much time on the profile, consider reducing the number of dynamic lights. Dynamic lights are wonderful. When skillfully placed and animated, they contribute so much realism to the scene. Unfortunately, they come at a heavy cost to the graphics card. More lights mean slower performance, so use them sparingly. Generally speaking, it's best to keep uh, best to keeping the number of lights under four. Remember, you can accomplish a lot by pre-baking the light effects discussed in later in this chapter. Okay, so you can pre-bake them. And also, if you're, you know, if you can get a hold of ray tracing, because that's what ray tracing does, it actually lowers that light ability, and it uh, helps with performance. Okay, lights with real-time shadows are even slower. Reduce the number of objects. It um, it goes without saying that fewer objects are faster. Sometimes, even just by batching up all the static objects in one you can achieve an impressive performance boost. A large number of objects usually cause the cinegraphic time in the profile to be unusually high. Okay, using instancing. If your game would, uh, world is populated by hundreds of individual objects, make sure they share one mesh. This is done by pressing Alt-D to duplicate the object rather than the usual Shift-D. Okay. Data block sharing makes the game load and run faster. Using, uh, when using instancing, object color can be handy uh, or a handy way to add some variation to the material without having to create multiple materials. So what they're saying is use Alt D co comparable to Shift D. I know I'm a I've got a bad habit of using Shift D because it's quick, it's easy, Shift D, and you can, you know, change it, modify it, and do whatever you need to. Alt D, when you do it, it changes that specific one. All you're doing is making an instance copy. So if you change it on one, it will change on the others, except you can use object color, which what uh, they uses in his game three. Um, if you change the object color, you can actually change the color of that object. Instead of making it blue, you can make it green, but this one will still stay blue because that's the object color for that particular one. When you're instancing, all you're doing is you're taking this deal here and you're making an instance copy over here, but you are basically just telling it, hey, see the outline of this, put it over here. Okay. Um, when you change this color, you'll change that color if you don't use the object color. If you just change your material, like change it into a blue material instead of a red material, then yeah, then both will change to red instead of blue. But if you use the object color and you keep this one blue and you change that one to green or red or purple, then it will change purple, but this one will still stay blue. Okay, very easy to remember. Instancing can be a very big friend. Okay, play with window size. If by resizing the 3D viewport in, uh, to a smaller size, you can get lar uh, a larger increase in performance. It means your game is limited by the fill rate performance of your graphics card. Trans, uh, transparent objects, complex shaders, and 2D filters are all fill rate heavy. Reducing these effects will make the game run faster on slower graphics cards. Most people who have good graphics cards won't have a problem, but if you have an older graphics card, it can uh, pose an, uh, uh, an issue if you're using transparent objects, complex shaders, and 2D filters. Okay. And I believe it or not, my uh, all my uh, barriers are basically what they call transparent objects. So it's a lot. <laughs> it's a, it eats out a lot. <laughs> all right, use Blender Player. Blender Player, the standalone game engine of Blender, can be a bit faster than Blender. So if you are looking for one last bit of performance out of the game, try switching to Blender Player. In fact, it's always a good idea to use Blender Play when publishing your game. Anyway, okay, so Blender Player is a standalone player, and I'm gonna, uh, I don't think it's in this one. Yeah, I don't believe it's in here. Yeah, right here. Okay, you've got your embedded player, and you got your standalone player. You're talking, they're talking about the embedded player, or the standalone player, not the embedded. The embedded is what 
Blender uses for like animations and stuff like that. You don't really want that. You want the the standalone players where it actually pulls it up into a separate window over uh, see, yeah over here, <laughs> and you know you can still have your object over here. Okay, and so you can see what it's doing and you can play it and see what it's all about. And so here's your resolution sizes. Okay, so keep that in mind when you're doing that. Use the Blender player. Okay, the standalone player. Watch the console. By default, the Blender console window is hidden on all operating systems. Turn on the console and see if there are any error messages being printed. Error messages generally indicate a much greater problem with the game. Not to mention, not to mention that an extensive amount of console printing can also down, uh, down the game significantly. Okay, what it's talking about is you're going to go right up here to Windows is to, to turn on the console window. On Windows, go to the main menu, click Window, okay, and then you're going to go to Toggle System Console, okay. That will bring up uh, this little window right here, okay. As you see, there's nothing in there because I haven't ran the game. But if you did run the game and you're wondering why the, the, the cube is just falling through the earth, one, it could be physics. For two, it could be that you're floating thing you know script you put on it isn't working or the material doesn't show up the material doesn't show up that means that it actually didn't work so you have to look into the console to find out and also i'm going to say this so that way you know people know do not hit x if you hit x it will close not just this window but also your blender window so be careful and don't do that and, and resist doing it because i've done it many a times by mistake uh, you want to hit minimize, okay? Minimize is your friend on that one, okay? To turn uh, to run Blender with the console window on OS X or Linux, launch the application from the command line. Anybody who does OS X or Linux, that's what you're gonna have to do is launch it from the command line, okay? I believe it just shows up in there. All right, so try another version of Blender. When all else else fails, consider the potential uh, possibility that there is a bug in Blender that ca that's causing the slowdown. This has happened before. Try your file with another older or newer version of Blender and see if the performance problem is still there. If you believe something is abnormally slow when it shouldn't be, fi uh, file a bug report so that the developers can, uh, can, can have a chance to fix it. This might not only solve your problem, but it makes the program better for everyone else too okay um believe it or not 2.6 uh 0 0.2.0 are no longer being or 2.79 and uh 0 0.2.0 and 0 0.2.5 are no longer being uh looked after everybody's moved on to uh 3.0 0, 0 uh 30 uh if you're using a bg a bge excuse me um if you're using a bge then you know uh, nine times out of ten, they're going to want to go with the new one. There's a couple of guys that still try to play around with the 2.5B uh, version. Um, you know, they're saying, oh, yeah, we're going to make it 2.6. Uh, i seen it, and it, to me, doesn't have anything else new that could actually make it worthwhile for me to use it because it still has issues and other issues because they're trying to use uh, code from uh, Blender 2. Point, or, I'm sorry, Blender 3.0 or plus. Okay, so be careful with that. Um, I would say if it doesn't run in 2.75, try to run in 2.0 uh, and see if that works. Um, 2.0 is the stronger one of the bunch, I believe. And that's the one I use for my game. And a lot of people do still. Um, 2.5 has still got some issues and problems that don't want to work right. And uh, I've actually ran into a few of these in past videos that something wasn't there that should have been and or something that should have ran did not so be aware of that and you know if it doesn't work on yours try it on 2.0 or try it on 2.5 or try it in 2.79 okay so that's going to be the end of this lesson and so uh we're going to end on page 14 and it's going to be advanced optimization techniques for next week let me switch back over to there we go so it's back over to here so that way you know i can actually put stuff up because <laughs> you know stuff will pop up somewhere over here you know usually around me that's like actually more so over there um and of course 
the subscribe button above me will probably pop up. Um, but next week, uh, page 14, Advanced Optimization Techniques. Till next week.